Hi there, and welcome to our podcast. And this week at London Visited, we go to St Martin in the Fields to tell you all about this iconic part of London. My name's Steve, and each week I'll bring to you the facts, history and information about different parts of this great capital. If you've been to London, are planning on visiting, live here, or just love London from afar, then this is the podcast for you. Don't forget to visit our sister channel on YouTube, London Visited, to see videos covering this place and so many others across London. And now to this week's podcast. St Martin's in the Fields is an English Anglican church on the northeast corner of Trafalgar Square in the city of Westminster. It is dedicated to St Martin of Tours. There has been a church on the site since at least the medieval period. It was at that time located in farmlands and fields beyond the London Wall when it was awarded to Westminster Abbey for oversight. It became a principal parish church west of the old city in the early modern period as Westminster's population grew. When its old structure was found to be near failure, the present building was consecrated. The present building was constructed in an influential neoclassical design by James Gibbs in 1722 to 1726. The church is one of the visual anchors adding to the open, urban space around Trafalgar Square. Excavations on the site in 2006 uncovered a grave from about AD 410. The site is outside the city limits of Roman London, as was the usual Roman practice for burials but it is particularly interesting for being so far outside, 1.6 kilometres or one statute mile southwest of Ludgate. And this is leading to a reappraisal of Westminster's importance at the time. The burial is thought by some to mark a Christian centre of that time, possibly reusing the site or building of a pagan temple. The earliest extant reference to the church is from 1222, with a dispute between the Abbot of Westminster and the Bishop of London as to who had control over it. The Archbishop of Canterbury decided in favour of Westminster, and the monks of Westminster Abbey began to use it. Henry VIII rebuilt the church in 1542 to keep plague victims in the area from having to pass through his palace of Whitehall. At this time, it was literally in the fields, an isolated position between the cities of Westminster and London. By the beginning of the reign of James I, the local population had increased greatly and the congregation had outgrown the building. In 1606, the king granted an acre of ground to the west of St Martin's Lane for a new churchyard and the building was enlarged eastwards over the old burial ground, increasing the length of the church by about half. At the same time, the church was, in the phrase of the time, thoroughly repaired and beautified. Later, in the 17th century, capacity was increased by the addition of galleries the creation of the new parishes of St Anne Soho and St James's Piccadilly, and the opening of a chapel in Oxenden Street also relieved some pressure on the space. As it stood at the beginning of the 18th century, the church was built of brick, rendered over with stone facings. The roof was tiled, and there was a stone tower with buttresses. A number of notables were buried in this phase of the church, including Robert Boyle, Nell Gwynne, John Parkinson and Sir John Birkenhead. A survey of 1710 found that the walls and the roof were in a state of decay. In 1720, Parliament passed an act for the rebuilding of the church, allowing for the sum of up to £22,000 to be raised by a rate on the parishioners. A temporary church was erected partly on the churchyard and partly on the ground in Lancaster Court. Advertisements were placed in the newspapers that bodies and monuments of those buried in the church or churchyard could be taken away for reinternment by relatives. The rebuilding commissioners selected James Gibbs to design the new church. His suggestion was for a church with a circular nave and domed ceiling, but the commissioners considered this scheme too expensive. Gibbs then produced a simpler plan, which they accepted. The foundation stone was laid on the 19th of March 1722, and the last stone of the spire was placed into position in December 1724. The total cost was £33,661, including the architect's fees. The west front of St Martin's has a portico, with a pediment supported by a giant order of Corinthian columns, six wide. In designing the church, Gibbs drew upon the works of Christopher Wren, but departed from Wren's practice in his integration of the tower into the church. Rather than considering it as a junk to the main body of the building, he constructed it within the west wall, so that it rises above the roof, immediately behind the portico. An arrangement also used at around the same time by John James at St George, Hanover Square. Although James's steeple is much too ambitious, the spire of St Martin's rises 192 feet, 59 metres, above the level of the church floor. The church is rectangular in plan, with six bay nave divided from the aisles by arcades of Corinthian columns. 
There are galleries over both aisles and at the west end. The nave ceiling is a flattened barrel vault, divided into panels by ribs. The panels are decorated with cherubs, clouds, shells and scrollwork, executed by Giuseppe Atari and Giannavi Baghetti. Until the creation of Trafalgar Square in the 1820s, Gibbs Church was crowded by other buildings. J.P. Malcolm, writing in 1807, said that the West Front would have a grand effect if the execrable watch house and sheds before it were removed, and described the sides of the church as lost in courts, where houses approached them to almost contact. The design was criticised widely at the time, but subsequently became extremely famous, being copied particularly widely in the United States. Although Gibbs was discreetly Catholic, his four-wall, long rectangular forepan, with a triangular gable roof, and tall, prominent centre-front steeple, and often columned front portico, became closely associated with Protestant church architecture worldwide. In Britain, the design of the 1730 St Andrew in the Square Church in Glasgow was inspired by it. In India, St Andrew's Church, Egmore Madras, now Chennai, is modelled on St Martin in the Fields. In South Africa, the Dutch Reformed Church in Craddock is modelled on St Martin in the Fields. Because of its prominent position, St Martin in the Fields is one of the most famous churches in London. Dick Shepherd, vicar from 1914 to 1927, who began programmes for the area's homeless, coined its ethos as Church of the Ever Open Door. The church is famous for its work with the young and homeless people through the connection at St Martin in the Fields, created in 2003, through the merger of two programmes dating at least to 1948. The connection shares with the Vicar's Relief Fund the money raised each year by the BBC Radio 4 Appeal's Christmas Appeal. The crypt houses a cafe which hosts jazz concerts whose profits support programmes of the church. The crypt is also home to the London Brass Rubbing Centre, established in 1975 as an art gallery, book and gift shop. A life-size marble statue of Henry Croft, London's first pearly king, was moved to the crypt in 2002 from its original site at St Pancras Cemetery. In January 2006, work began on a £36 million renewal project. The project included renewing the church itself, as well as provision of facilities encompassing the church's crypt, a row of buildings to the north and some significant new underground spaces in between. The funding included a grant of £15 million from the Heritage Lottery Fund. The church and the crypt reopened in the summer of 2008. Twelve historic bells from St Martin in the Fields, cast in 1725, were included in the peal of the Swan Bell Towers in Perth, Australia. The current set of 12 bells, cast in 1988, which replaced the old ones, are rung every Sunday between 9am and 10am by the St Martin in the Fields band bell ringers. Being in a prominent central London location, the exterior of the church building frequently appears in films, including Notting Hill and Enigma, and television programmes including Doctor Who and Sherlock. References to the church take place in the following novels. E.M. Forster, a Room with a View, from 1908. 1984 by George Orwell, from 1949. Also from 1949, The Parasites, by Daphne du Maurier. 2004, Quicksilver, by Niall Stevenson. And in 2012, Winter of the World, by Ken Follett. References to the church occur also in the following poems. The 1893, The Kingdom of God, by Francis Thompson. And in 2009, Now Traveller, Whose Journey Passes Through, by Andrew Motion. The church may be the St Martins referred to also in the nursery rhyme known as Oranges and Lemons. The church also has a close relationship with the royal family, whose parish church it is, as well as with 10 Downing Street and also the Admiralty. The St Martin in the Fields charity supports homeless and vulnerably housed people. The church has raised money for vulnerable people in its annual Christmas appeal since 1920 and in an annual BBC radio broadcast since December 1927. The connection at St Martin's is located next to the church and works closely with the church's charity. It supports 4,000 homeless people in London each year by providing accommodation, medical and dental care, skills training and creative activities. So, I hope you've enjoyed our in-depth look at St Martin in the Fields. Whatever podcast service you use to listen to this, please do subscribe to get updates on new shows and also please leave us some feedback. Please also let me know any places you'd like us to feature in future podcasts and you can let me know through our website www.londonvisited.co.uk or you can email me directly on londonvisited at gmail.com or contacting us on Twitter and Instagram at London Visited or Facebook on at The London Visited. Thanks for listening. Really hope you enjoyed our podcast and we'll see you very soon on the next one. Bye. <laughs>